Great. So we're going to be recorded. So, you know. Um, so this is a case study, basically, um, about doing uh, what I'm saying there uh, to be able to automate the collection of a data glossary or a corpus. So the, I, I did this when I was at MBN, and we had a pretty large data warehouse, 200,000 data warehouse columns, but we had a problem in, with fully understanding um, many of the acronyms that were in the data warehouse and also um, trying, to, um, uh, trying to form a centralised data model. The data warehouse consisted mainly of source systems that had been loaded in and uh, we were still struggling with how we were going to use it. So uh, this, I'll demonstrate in this presentation how we were able to extract about 6,000 words, 1,000 acronyms and 5,000 words. Many of the words are just ordinary words but um, uh, quite a few of them were special words that were quite unique to um, that particular client, which was the NBN. Um, we'd started off with a list of about uh, 500 words, 500 acronyms, and we were able to double that in the process of collecting this stuff. Um, we were also able to link the, um, the terms, the phrases, to the columns that they appeared in and so forth, so we can have an index uh, uh, to and fro. So you can see that as it goes through. So why is, this, why is this relevant to you? Hopefully you're one of these, the, you've uh, got a concern, but one of the first steps in data management uh, is creating a data glossary. And so do you have a complete data glossary? Is, uh, are the data glossary terms actually even used in your database? Uh, can you map those data glossary back to the database columns? And can you separate out the acronyms from the words? And the acronyms are important because they're very dense semantically. They're normally you know, three or four words that are created as a, um, as a term, and, they, and they're very important for communication within a, um, uh, within a company. Um, and uh, certainly in the case of MBN, there was a very much an acronym shock. People moved into there and they had to know what FSAMs and GSAMs and all these sort of terms, which are quite unusual but unique to MBN, uh, and people had to get up to um, that very quickly. So who is this for? Well, all staff um, uh, will always find a data glossary useful especially new staff or staff that are transferred into a new area because each area has its own set of uh, acronyms and terms as well. Business analysts obviously uh, need this as well to be able to determine um, if the systems actually do support the, the, the terms and typically you, you, you might hoover them up from an act and you'll find that half the terms of the act aren't defined in any system at all, in which case you've got to ask yourself a question, how well do our systems support the objectives of the act? Um, business analysts also to resolve confusion between different areas. Um, I was at Commonwealth Bank and we had a great big debate about what account was. And the word account meant three different things in three different parts of the bank. Um, and then to integrate across those business areas. And finally for data modelers um, who need to be able to enforce more consistent design rules when generating out the SQL and DDL uh, and to, prefer, uh, to improve productivity around that, uh, to be able to publish that metadata out for the business analysts and to be able to review the business terms in the same way the business analysts do, but at a lower level of detail. One of the core things is uh, building a corpus, and a corpus is, is a term I've taken straight out of natural language processing, and this is simply the full set of words used in, in an enterprise. Um, now, the corpus that I was able to generate is 6,000 words, but your typical educated person knows about 15,000 words. So, you, it, um, it can go larger than that, obviously, until you get to um, uh, something like, you know, a 10,000 might be a, a, like a typical limit. They're, they're specific to the enterprise, so you can't just say, well, we'll just get Hoover it off the enterprise, uh, Google or whatever. You've got to think about what the enterprise is doing and what terms that they, they're using. And so often you collect them manually from the parliamentary acts, any manuals, data dictionaries that are used. Um, and, but most words are obviously common and obvious, you know, is and have and whatever, and you've got to be able to filter out those ones until you come down to the core, core words. So the valuable terms are those which are unique to the organisation, homonyms, which create confusion, and acronyms, which are these, these much denser, um, shortened terms of common phrases with that shared meaning semantics behind them. 
So how do you do this technically? Well, the word that you use is parsing. And so the, the key idea of a, of a parser is it's any function that takes text and builds a data structure. That's, a, that's the computer science term, and that's very useful in this context. And so in this case, we will take a string and produce a list of phrases. So it's a very simple data structure. We're not talking trees or anything complicated like that. And so, and I've given some examples of what I mean by that. So worksites I'll treat as a single word. And so that will be a single word worksites inside the phrase list. Uh, similarly, this work skill, I'll treat as two separate words. So in the phrase list, this becomes work and skill. Uh, and work status is also split in that word. Now that's entirely arbitrary. It's, it's whatever you want to do with your um, uh, lists of words that you want to generate. Um, and obviously plurals and, um, and singulars, uh, you know, um, pop up as words as well. I'm not trying to do anything um, grammatical to the words. So I'm not actually saying, dealing with that as a lexeme, which is a single unit uh, of meaning, and say this is just this one plus a uh, plural. So I'm just treating them as just text strings, but collecting them together in this list of phrases, which is what the, the uh, boxes mean. Um, so this is a semi-automated power tool. It's what I use um, myself, um, and it grew out of fighting Excel and Orc and all these other tools that you use in order to help you do things, but in actual fact, uh, pretty broken. Um, it, it's a non-technical talk. I'm not going to jump into the code and explain to you how that works. I'm just going to show you the, the, the inputs and the outputs and so forth. Um, uh, if you want to, there's another great meetup in Canberra called CanFP. I'll be giving a similar, well, not this presentation, but a similar presentation tomorrow night. So this is, sorry for the crudity of the thing, I had to draw it myself. So these are the primary ent entities in this little model to describe how we collect the corpus and then pass it against all the names that occur in an organisation and generate out the, the output. So the, 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 the central entity is phrase. This is a single uh, word of some meaning to the, um, uh, to the organisation. I'm more than happy to send out this presentation, so Tim can send it out. So just give, ask Tim for your email address and I'll, I'll send it out to everybody. So um, uh, above a phrase is a phrase type, and this can be acronyms and so forth, different kinds of words. And authority is some sort of organisation that is the standard for defining a particular term. So that might be an act, or it might be a, a, a standards organisation, or it might just be internal usage. And the domain is the namespace for the term. So whether it's an engineering term or a you know, sort of IT term or a business term or whatever. Um, now, in order to be able to parse, you need to be able to map between little snippets of, of text, and that's what a snippet is, to the phrase. And this is just a simple, you know, um, if I've got a work in progress, then I'll have a work in progress snippet, and that'll be mapping to WIP, which will be the phrase. So that's actually kind of trivial, but it's, it's an important little thing. This is the set of names. So this will be all the names that you collect for, from whatever source. In, in this case, it was 200,000 words, uh, names taken from the data warehouse. Um, in the demo I'm giving today, that's only 500 there, but this is the full 6,000 corpus of words for that particular organisation. So they're the inputs. The outputs are um, the phrase to name. So these 6,000 uh, phrases can then be mapped to the waves names that actually have them. So that's a simply um, many to many links. So that's, that's, that's bread and butter for everybody here in this audience. And this is the opposite. This is the name to phrase. So if there's 200,000 rows there, there'll be 200,000 rows there. So that's just the uh, names to phrases, what it's actually passed into. Questions anytime? Um, absolutely. So, so phrase types. So these are the uh, phrase types, which is what you would expect to see. A acronyms is an important phrase type, and um, um, WOP for work in progress. Um, any normal word, so work, contractions are quite important. Uh, so why, why R for year, and so forth. There's very limited number of letters and uh, numbers, obviously. Multiple words is really important, because what happen actually happens is when the parsing occurs, I've got to be able to separate work from works, from work status, from work skill. So I end up with a lot of these multiple words in order to pass correctly. Um, 
and the other ones are just ordinary names. Finally, there's Z rubbish because there's misspellings everywhere and you have to be able to identify those misspellings and not throw them out and create an error, just know that they exist and here they are type thing. Because we're dealing with the real world, not the perfect world. Domains, and these are just the typical domains that you'd find in a telco, you know, physical network inform information technology. This is not automated, this is manually uh, applied. Authority, again, this is manually applied, this is part of the automated bit. And so you have a set of quite, in, but it's very important to get these because you end up in, a, in definition wars. People have, can be very passionate about things, including defining terms. And so you say to yourself, okay, well, you, you get a good business analyst involved and they will sit down and they'll sort of sort give a list and then you'll say, well, if there's a standard definition from outside the organisation, should we adopt that? And if we do, well, that's good. Uh, there still might be somebody who says, yes, I've got to have mine. So you have both. Um, and so, um, so that people can see clearly uh, who decided for a particular definition and then they can decide in their own mind which one that they're going to really adopt. So this is an example of a phrase table. So you can see here the work in progress. This is the key for the table and these are the dependent columns. Um, so WIP is expanded to work in progress and it's for an all domain so that just, that's not unique. Uh, work, the contraction YR, E, and so forth. So that's, all, that's what you would expect to see. And there's 6,000 of those in this corpus that, are, that I've built. So this is the input in terms of the columns. So it's a simple set of schemas and table names and column names and so forth. And so this, this is actually kind of, um, most of them are separated by an underscore, but I don't use underscore as my separator because that's, that's an easy trick to get in. And you get a lot of these sort of things where people have got a camel chaos you know, term on, on, a, you know, on a Python program or whatever, and it all collapses. It, you know, it just goes up a case and it, it ends up looking like German. And so you have to be able to parse the actual words out. And that, that's a little bit tricky, but I was able to do that. All right, so this is the snippet to phrase. I'm not going to really belabor this one. It's just sort of like, like we've got two phrases. This is the key and, uh, and the snippet here, um, the foreign key rather. This uh, is keyed on capital uh, case and uh, uppercase and so forth. So when it discovers a string of that kind, it's all case sensitive, it'll identify this is the correct phrase or if it's that, it'll identify that as the correct phrase. That's all it is. It's just a pointer table. Now, this is, um, a, this, is the, this is output, so this is the results. And so we can see this is, the, this is the mapping from names to phrases. So for each name, it'll show the phrase list and any unparsed string. Um, and so this will be fairly large. It'll be the same as the number of columns you've got. Um, uh, and we've got some good examples of how, how it sort of worked. So you can see here, action when complete turns into this phrase list, action comma when comma complete. And so there's no underscore, but in actual fact, it passes OK. Um, this one also passes OK, even though it's rather long. Order, total elapsed duration hours, and so forth. Now, there's a couple of... Now, from that point on, we can see there's been some parse errors. And so we've got... Uh, this one becomes effort tracking total, and then time spent becomes times and then a PE and then an NT and hour. So there's a, there's a problem with that, with that. So you visually inspect it. Um, you know, like not everything. And so once you've got that, you can say, well, obviously I need to add a word called time spent in order for this to be able to pass correctly into that, that bit. And the same thing occurs here with the instantiation number. And so it's, 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 it's done its best to pass, but it's come up with the inst, anti, at, io, n, and so forth. The number is okay, so the parsing works fine for that. And so that's another word I need to add. I've got this thing, which is uh, retries. It's a bit of a fail, and parent signal, and so forth. So, so that's what I do after the running of the program. I inspect this to see what actually is turned out, and use that to discover um, um, additional terms that should go into the corpus, into the phrase list. And then the last thing is the is the other way. So phrase to name. And so we can see here. Um, the, the, 
This is only for acronyms. So CI is an acronym, and that's a configuration item, which is spot on. That's what there's, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of these in NBN, and then it breaks down into task and a service CI, and that so that actually looks good. Then you've got the next one, which is a GUID, globally unique ID, and again it, it it's that looks right. But then you've come in here, look for IES, which is an acronym somewhere, but that's in num retries, which we saw the other way was incorrect. So we know that this is an invalid acronym for this particular uh, set of columns. So, so you know that's, that, that's another way to say, okay, that, so these are all false passes for the, so you can see from the other point of view how that, how that fits. So this is a, just a summary of the data flow diagram. So um, the, the snippets to phrases are, are, are put into, uh, are inputs into the parse program. Um, this generates a thing called name to snippet. So each name is split up into those snippets that we just saw. Uh, you know, uh, simulation is S, I, M, whatever. And then this is gen joined to the phrases, which you've also defined. And that generates an output called nine, for name to phrase, which you've also was part of the output now, and then that is inverted to become phrase to name. So this is the big one. This is the 200,000 column one. This is the 6,000 one, and that's the one you really want to look at at the end to determine how well your your corpus has done in being able to um, break down all your names. All right. So I'll just do the a demonstration. So we've got here. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Just loading up the program that runs everything. So just compiling it, getting it going. All right, we run it. So it runs through a variety of checks and so forth at the very beginning. Um, and now it's taking an old corpus against the names. So I've got my 6,000 corpus against 500 names and generating out the um, uh, name to phrase and phrase to name. Takes about a minute. It's rumbling along. Software always rumbles when it's working. I've noticed. Rumble, rumble, rumble. So this will So we'll just search for one of those. Troublesome guys. So you can see here, 
the simulation is mispassed into that long thing that was before. And there's a number of other ones here that I can scroll up and down to see if I can find them. Or I can just uh, find it. Let's see. Yeah, so you can see there that the instantiation numbers become um, is is unpassed effectively, um, and the other ones are, are similar. So what I'll do is add in um, the correct uh, phrases into the phrase uh, input and into the um, uh, phrase snippet. I pre-prepared these, so I won't bore you with my my skills with a mouse. So that's in the phrase file, and I need to do the same thing, similar thing, into the on my bike ride. I realised that I could probably cut out this particular bit. Um, because most snippets are pretty, are pretty. Uh, the it's a, it's a very simple file, as you can see. It's just a one to one between the. There we are. So these are our snippets. Alright, so these will be the words that I've discovered I need to add to the corpus. Alright. Okay. So we need to rumble again. So these checks are things for like um, whether they're a key, whether the the, cotton, the, the keys are actually unique in those two inputs and so forth. Um, uh, uh, whether there's not a relationship between the snippets and the, and the phrase table uh, and so forth. So they're the kind of things that you'd expect to see in a relational environment. Uh, so that's sort of, you've got to take care of these sort of things yourself in this sort of uh, world. So hopefully then with this input we'll be able to see those things correctly passed. So you can see here that the um, the number of retries is now correctly passed into the num and retries, and the uh, time spent is good. Um, parent signal is parent comma signal and so forth. Um, I mean it's pretty simple, but it's useful because it does it at scale. Anyway, so if you do want to play with the code, it's all open source, so you can get it from that. And this is the standard that I wrote, which is just a, based on the Triple One Seventy Nine, which relates between the two. And um, I, in my spare time, thinking of how to get words out of documents, not just out of SQL. Um, uh, maybe introduce some some stuff from the NLP area about lexemes and, and grammar to be able to determine 
past and future tense and so forth, uh, which will improve the passing and so forth, um, and uh, more from the NLP space. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, I haven't actually done it, but basically the, uh, they're just word documents in effect. So you just turn them into sets of strings and then you run the program over that. So that technically it wouldn't be that difficult. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a good guy I was working, uh, not working with, but he, he gave a presentation at the GANFB and there he's doing, uh, he's using the, some of the, um, the programming language that I'm using uh, with a lo language library called Pandoc. And what they're doing, what he's doing, is very clever. Um, he's, he's, he's able to determine um, references between acts. And uh, I think it was, I think it's DHS, I'm not too sure where he's working, but he's trying to, to, to determine how well the acts referenced each other uh, based on their reference and so forth. So he'd do a reference uh, that have a paragraph behind it to say if that X referenced that thing and if that reference still existed or not because they, they, they put acts through parliament without properly vetting them. And so, so, they're trying to do, so they're trying to be consistent in what they're doing as bureaucrats. And they, they want to test to make sure that, that the set of things they have to do administratively are consistent and so forth. It was, uh, very interesting. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's infinite loops. Yes, they're, they're everywhere. But uh, this is much simpler than what he was doing. Any other questions? Do you find it useful? Would you like to do it? Or no? no? One of the things that I found it quite useful to be able to do is I could transform words uh, when generating out between the, um, the words that were available in the, in, in the source area, the landing zone of the data warehouse, and converting it into into more of the target area in the data warehouse. So I could um, uh, fix up misspellings, I could um, put in underscores or something like that to separate out the words to make it easier for business users to, to, to read it. Um, and uh, where, where some words were inconsistent, then we'd have a, have a chat to the business analyst and say, well, do we really want to expose this word and so forth. That, that sort of thing then became possible. We could do that as a transformation uh, on the way through. But, um, and then finally, when they get to look at it, the, the end business users, not the business analyst, could see something that was relatively coherent and you've, you've, you've covered up all the gaps and all the, all the holes and all the nasty bits of stuff you don't want them to see. Um, it's, more of a, it's more of a living in the real world, so you get what, what you're given and so um, it's certainly possible to check to see whether they're consistent with naming conventions, but typically what I do is I just take whatever the source system says something is, it's, it's in the landing zone. Because that, that, that helps tra traceability. And then only later on do I say, okay, well, we'll make some naming convention changes, but it's really easy to, to make a big, like a big ball of mud, you know, with changing all the names of everything. So as far as possible, I let the names go all the way through, as far as possible, so that they the uh, business analyst can then talk to the programmer of a source system and say, we've got this funny column, what does it mean? And the programmer of the, of the source system probably knows. But if, you've if you change the name of the way through, then they, they won't know and they, they won't have seen the mappings. Yeah, so that's fine for the lending service, that's good. Yeah. But when you're trying to integrate data into... You know, oh, then you must have some changes. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Do Yes, you could, yes. That's a good use case for exactly why you would do that. Yes. Um, well, you'd come to a, like, because that, that's also something that you've got to agree with. So whatever that's been agreed to at the organisation, rather than opening up that can of worms and say, okay, well, I'll take what you've got. If you haven't got anything, oh, yes, I've got this type thing, you know, type thing. So, you know, yeah. But you do need to integrate at some stage, something, some, some of the stuff, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, yes. Could you please join me in thanking Matt for his yeah, insightful presentation?
Thank you very much, Matt. Right,